Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I hereby call this August the 8th meeting of the Public Safety Committee to order. Uh, before we get started, I just want to take a moment, as I always do, to recognize our Director of Emergency Management, Mr. Mel Sattler. Thank you for being here. Our, our Chief of Police, Chief Roundtree, we thank you also. And our Fire Chief, uh, Chief Mayo, uh, is in the house. Uh, thank you for being here as well, and all of our citizens and staff. Uh, we have several items on the general agenda. There is an item recognizing firefighter Cliff Jones for heroic acts on June 26, 2016. There's also an item recognizing the Winston-Salem Fire Stations for Safety Awards, a resolution approving grants from the successful outcomes after release contingency funding for that program. Uh, item G4 is a report from the Winston-Salem Police Department on 21st century policing. And the last item, item G5, a conversation about the restriction of animal acts in the city of Winston-Salem. Items on the consent agenda are unanimously approved unless a council member or uh, a member uh, wishes to, it to be pulled for consideration. And with that being said, members of the committee, are there any items on the consent agenda that should be pulled for consideration? <coughs> Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion. Second. Motion and properly second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, the consent agenda is approved unanimously. Item G1, please. Item G1, recognition of firefighter Cliff Jones for heroic acts on June 26, 2016. All right, queuing us up is our Chief of Fire, uh, Chief Mayo. You have the floor, please, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mayor, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, other members of the committee and council. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm happy yeah. this right. afternoon to recognize right. firefighter Cliff Jones. Uh, Cliff, by the way, is retiring. Uh, August 29th will be his last day. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll give you a We thank him for his 30 years of credible service to the citizens of Winston-Salem. Uh, Cliff, uh, and this, Mr. Chairman, uh, reinforces the, uh, the need for speed, if you will, uh, and, and reinforces the fact that if firefighters are going to make a difference uh, in true emergencies, then we have to get to the scene in a hurry. Uh, it also reinforces uh, the importance of bystander CPR, and it's why we uh, encourage citizens of Winston-Salem uh, to uh, learn by what we call compressions only CPR and this is an opportunity if you'll indulge me to Please really advertise to those who are watching and listening uh, that the Winston-Salem Fire Department provides compressions only CPR to the public free of charge uh, and we we can we can do that uh, with a crowd of up to 50 people at the time and uh, so it's a great thing for uh, civic groups, church organizations, uh, you know, any, anybody like that who, who is in the community who wants us to come out and deliver those classes would be happy to do that. And of course it is uh, free of charge. So uh, on June 26, uh, Cliff was at a church picnic. Uh, there was a pool in the backyard. Uh, he was enjoying himself, fellowshipping with his other uh, fellow parishioners and uh, had uh, heard, heard somebody screaming. He uh, went around to the back of the house and uh, he arrived just in time to see uh, another adult individual uh, pulling a 12-year-old child uh, from the pool. So uh, Cliff, Cliff pulled that child from the pool, assessed him uh, as his training teaches him to do, the fire and medical training that we deliver. Uh, he assessed that individual, determined that they had no pulse and they were not breathing, and uh, he uh, immediately activated the 911 system uh, and began CPR. And the result is that child uh, spent five days at Baptist Hospital but was discharged neurologically intact, uh, and he will go on to live a normal life uh, thanks to Cliff's uh, wow. career. So I have a certificate of commendation that says you are hereby recognized and applauded for your quick and decisive emergency actions that saved the life of a 12-year-old drowning victim on June 26, 2016. And uh, I'd like to present that to Cliff tonight uh, and thank you for being in the right place at the right time and doing the right thing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have to let him go? 
<laughs> we have to let him retire? Can we keep him on? No. Let's <laughs> sounds like we don't want to let you retire, Mr. Jones. We probably need to have that conversation after the meeting. So I, I'll say this, Mr. Jones, I think there are, there are a number of council members who wish to speak. I'll start by saying I believe not only in Winston-Salem, but you're a true American hero. Um, our, our families do have somewhat of some familiarity, and I'd ask, you know, they share you with us every single day, or whenever you're on duty, and with the family of Mr. Jones, please stand and be recognized. Mayor Pro Tem Burke. Yes, I am so proud. I was sitting here just as happy as I could be because I was also his counselor. <laughs> <laughs> and his father has been with this city. His mother, Ms. Gloria Jones, has been a community person. His aunt lives in my ward, and his sister, who's a minister, I was her counselor. <laughs> and his sister, who's with the arts, I was her counselor. She plays the cello. Oh, that. Okay. And then the youngest boy, I was here. He's a man, too. So it's not a person in this city, north, east, south, west, white, black, diverse, in between, that I have not touched these families, being in education. And he was a very fine young boy growing up, and he grew to be such a fine young man. And he's retired, but he also has a business. You need not worry. Okay. He's very creative, the whole family. Thank you. Anything else? Councilman Montgomery. Uh, just again to, to say a, a great thank you to, to uh, Mr. Jones as well as uh, to, to all of our firefighters. I've, I've mentioned it before in one of the meetings uh, that I've personally witnessed the, the great stature um, and, 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 and training of our fire department. Um, as you all know, I'm the executive director at Bethesda Center for Homeless. And about a year ago, we had to call 911 for one of our guests who uh, had a heart attack and stopped breathing. And it was our firefighters who did CPR on him and, uh, until EMS arrived and they stayed. When he got there, they didn't think he was gonna make it. And it was because of the great uh, attention uh, that our firefighters and the training they have uh, that he was able to make it and to recover. And so again, I say thank you personally and thank you to the fire department for the great work that you all do every day for us along with our other uh, first responders. Thank you. Councilmember Light. Mr. Jones, before you take your seat, uh, we always talk uh, when things don't go well, rightfully so, or we have conversations about that. When things are going well and when people are doing what they're supposed to do and protecting the people of this community, we want to highlight that. So again, thank you for your service. And I'm sure everyone would like to shake your hand. And so if you don't, if you don't mind, I saw Councilmember Bessie almost beat us to the punch. But <laughs> if you come around and we'll shake your hand, please, sir. Thanks again to Mr. Jones. As he takes his seat, uh, we will move to item number G2. Item G2, recognition of Winston-Salem Fire Stations for safety awards. And giving us uh, the second presentation is, again, Chief Mayo. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm going to turn this presentation over to our Assistant Chief of Safety and Training, Tad Byram, along with the uh, City's Risk Manager, Nick Webster. We had three fire stations who have won multi-year uh, gold awards from the North Carolina Department of Labor for uh, items related to safety as uh, and Chief Byron can probably explain that to you better than I can so right. I'm going to turn it over to him. Thank you Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Assistant Chief Byron. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Chairman, Madam Pro Tem, uh, other esteemed members of council, uh, Mr. City Manager. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to uh, turn the floor over to Mr. Nick Webster uh, to give a few words. Uh, we've developed, I think, a pretty good partnership 
between the fire department and risk management, and I definitely want to acknowledge their role in helping us achieve this. Mr. Webster. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mayor, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, ladies and gentlemen of the council and committee, it's no surprise that those most familiar with the fragility of human life would be the most vigilant in protecting it. Mr. Jones proved that uh, through his heroic act, and the Winston-Salem Fire Department has proven it again uh, through their receipt of these awards. I would like to offer my sin sincere congratulations to the fire department, not just for these wonderful achievements, but also, but also for what they represent, which are accidents that didn't happen, and employees who went home safe and sound to their families at the end of the day. Uh, through the leadership of Chief Mayo, Assistant Chief Byram, and other members of the fire department, they have created an example for the rest of the city to follow. And I would like to thank them for their partnership, for their hard work, and for their dedication to employee safety. Thank you. Thank you. Just to further explain the awards, uh, 17 of our 19 fire stations uh, were awarded. We had 13 stations that were awarded gold and four stations that were awarded silver. Um, and that's uh, 17 city locations out of, I believe, 43 that won safety awards. Uh, so we're very proud of that fact. And just to uh, explain what this is, uh, this has to do with reportable injuries, uh, what the North Carolina Department of Labor uh, considers to be a, a reportable injury. And it's based on what's called the DART rate, uh, which is days away, uh, restricted or transferred. And our awards were based on the fact that these stations had DART rates that were below the uh, national industry standards. So that's how these awards came about. And most importantly, this could not have been done without the hard work of our men and women that uh, work for us day in and day out. And I don't have to tell you all how dangerous our job is. Um, so we're very proud of the fact that we have three stations with uh, multi-year awards. So um, first of all, I would like to recognize um, Station 20, which received their fifth year plaque for, uh, for gold. All right. Thank you. And again, to Station 20, to Engine 20, and to all of our firefighters, I say this about all our public safety personnel. I might be a little biased because I'm from this city, but we've got the best fire department in all of America. We appreciate what you do. Thank you. Uh, the next station I would like to recognize is, oh, excuse me. Uh, can, can you uh, tell each tell tell the council where the location or the stations are? I know you know the numbers, but they forget. So Station Twenty is in the North Ward. Yes, sir. <laughs> Nathaniel okay. Rural Hall Road, right? It's a uh, Coger Lane off of Highway 65, uh, Nathaniel Rural Hall Road. Right. All right. The next station I like to recognize is Fire Station Six, which is our Ardmore community. They're on West Academy Street. And this is the seventh consecutive year for Fire Station 6. Right. And thank you to Fire Station 6. And I think Councilman Bobesi shakes your hand for all of us. Yeah. Right. Congratulations. <laughs> 
This is Chief Bowman. And the next station uh, is Station 19 in the uh, southeast part of the city, uh, located off of uh, Glen High Road. It's our newest facility. It was constructed with uh, some federal grant money a few years ago. This is their eighth consecutive gold award. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> Chief Mayo. Outstanding employees, and we're really proud of them. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your time. Thank you for what you do. Before we move to item G3, Mayor Pro Tem Burt wanted to make some brief comments. Oh, yes, we appreciate all of our firemen, and uh, we're so pleased and proud of you. But I failed to recognize Mrs. Jones, the wife and Mrs. Jones. See, he has his own family, but mom and dad, sister and brother, but he's got wife and children too. <laughs> so I thank you. All right, item G3, please. Item G3, resolution approving grants from successful outcomes after release contingency funding. And giving us the report is Mr. Ben Rao, the assistant city manager. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Taylor, Mayor Joins, Mayor Pro Tem Burke, and members of the City Council. As part of the adoption of the 2016-2017 budget, the Mayor and City Council appropriated $50,000 in contingency funding for the Successful Outcomes After Release Program. Since the adoption of the budget, the City staff uh, have received seven requests for funding from the contingency funds. I will just briefly run down the list here. Uh, Silver Lining Youth Services for their STARS Teen Development Program, My Brother Second Chance, which is a youth uh, mentoring program, Southside Rides, which provides job training for ex-offenders, in particular in the automotive repair uh, field, How Is Your Heart Project, which uh, administers the Beating Up Bad Habits, which is a summer boxing camp, uh, the YWCA, the Holly House, and Project New Start, which is a ranchy program for women, the Josh Howard Foundation, their Community Progressive Development Program, which provides employment readiness uh, training. And then finally, Hoops for Life, which provides uh, basketball camps for children ages 5 to 17. So all these agencies provide some form of assistance to ask-risk populations, whether ex-offenders or at-risk youth. Uh, three of the agencies uh, have applied for funding for the first time. A uh, internal staff team uh, from the city manager's office Community and Business Development Department and the Police Department's Community Resources Department uh, reviewed all seven applications. And based on their review, they are recommending that for the three first time uh, requests, that the city provide seat funding for those particular agencies. The seat funding would be maximum assistance of $5,000, uh, half of that, and, and as part of receiving that funding, those three agencies would have to go through city sponsored. Uh, capacity building training to help them further develop their, their management infrastructure and their capacity to be able to serve their, their, pop, their client populations. Uh, as part of that, their agreement with the, with the city, they would get receive half the funding up front, and then upon <coughs> completion of the city-sponsored training, they would receive the remaining funding. The remaining four agencies would receive their funding according to the city's established process where they would have to provide regular reports on performance in their budget and then they would receive uh, funding based on those reports. Uh, the total amount that is recommended by staff totals $40,000. And those dollar amounts, those specific dollar amounts, are provided in the council action in the, re in the resolution. Uh, the remaining $10,000, part of that would be used to pay for the city sponsored capacity building training, and then the remaining amount would be available for any future needs identified by council. We have to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Rao. Uh, members of the committee, members of the council, as you've heard and you well know, uh, in this city, we have several initiatives that deal with uh, reducing poverty, uh, that deal with promoting community development. And this initiative was created about three years ago uh, in two components, to help former offenders who have difficulty finding employment uh, to increase their skills and their capacity by, number one, hiring them directly with the city in Winston-Salem, 
And the second component is we use uh, to fund organizations that support the work of reducing that at-risk population. Uh, we have before us uh, 50 additional thousand dollars that were added to the budget as Mr. Rao mentioned. There's a number of people who supported that, including the uh, Community Roundtable uh, Action Team. We're very supportive of this, this money that's been added. Uh, the committee and several other people have vetted these agencies down to the T. Uh, we feel that this is the best use of our SOAR funding, and uh, those have been presented to you at this time. So are there any questions for Mr. Rao? There are members of uh, the, the representing organizations here today. I'm looking around the room, and I see pretty much everyone is represented. Uh, they're here, willing and ready to answer any questions that you might have about their organizations. Uh, is anyone who has anything to, to uh, talk about? Any questions at this time? Mayor Pro Tem Burke. I'll just make the comment I made earlier that when we have agencies who will come and help us to make our city a better place, it's appreciated because our youth more than ever need to see mentors and people who can partner with the city to make it a place where all of us can be comfortable. I said earlier when I was meeting with Mr. Page uh, that summer is just about over, and we've done pretty good in our city. People have kept rather calm, and we're blessed. And so with what you're doing, you're going to help us to make sure that we continue to have a good place for all of us, and I thank you. Councilmember McIntosh. I'm happy to see that we're holding back $10,000 for capacity building. Um, especially when there's so many good causes, it's hard to, to say no. But I, that $10,000 will go a long way towards leveraging and training the organization so that they can build their capacity and do more in the community. So I, I think that's a very smart thing to do. Thank you, sir. Councilmember Light. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't <laughs> uh, recognize one of the, uh, this wonderful group of applicants, uh, agencies, and that is uh, the YWCA's Hawley House who, which is the uh, only women's, registered women's uh, after release support group in the state, is it, Kristen? Yes, ma'am, it's like, it's the only, uh, not in the state, but in the triad area, we're the only state license facility for women. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And uh, have a, an extraordinary uh, outcome. Mm -hmm. Zero recidivism. So, <laughs> Mr. O'Leary, if you if you if you give us one moment, please. We we have actually uh, three people who have signed up to speak. Okay. I wanted to make sure I got the comments from the council and from the committee first, and we'll defer uh, to uh, the organizations and whoever else might might want to speak about this matter. So we'll get to you in one moment, Councilmember Adams. Thank you, Chair Taylor. Again, we want to thank all of you for what you do, and I think they heard me in the the last meeting and they hear me all the time when Chair Taylor told me that uh, you would all be here. Uh, Chair Taylor, uh, Chairman Taylor, I would like for each of the organizations to give a two minute at least uh, composition. I know that's not a lot of time, but when you're passionate about whatever it is you're passionate about, you can get it done. You got your two minute elevator speech. So I'd like to hear about exactly what they do, how they're doing it, and what are the numbers looking like in success rates for the people that have either been in their programs or they're having? All right, so, so what we'll do is, is start with Ms. O'Leary, uh, who has signed up to speak. If you will come to the podium, if you give, give your name and address for the record, and give us your two-minute elevator speech about your organization. Thank you, Chairperson, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and Council members. I appreciate you having me here. I did put some thank you cards on the table before you came back to the table. Um, I have been with the YWCA for 10 years and I am a, I am a product of the program. Um, so I have a passion for what we're doing for the women and the importance of helping women coming out of incarceration have so many roadblocks, but I am a success story. And so I love to help the women help themselves when they get out. We do have a 100% success rate with the women that we have helped coming out of incarceration. There has been 30 in my 10 years that we have helped, none of which have gone back to an incarceration setting. We have a 75% success rate with the women that, are else, that aren't coming out of incarceration, and I did bring a flyer for you to pass around Thank you. with some brief statistics about what we do and how we're doing it. 
we have a nine to 18 month program. So they have enough time to start over. They learn from scratch. We start over. We don't care what their past is, how they got there, what they did to get there. It's about starting over and how can we meet, help you become productive members of society? How can we help you get a job? How can we help you keep a job? How can we help you get your children back, keep your children, and continue becoming productive members and taxpaying citizens? And we have gotten pretty good at what we do. The 75 to 80% success rate is twice the national average. And the only thing I'm asking the council to help me do is expand. Because if I had a big building where I can serve more than six women, I promise you a great big success rate. And I think that I could reduce recidivism by 50% in our city alone if I had the building. Thank you, ma'am. And Councilmember Adams, I may have misspoke. I did get information that Mr. Howard from Silver Lining Youth Services would not be here. Uh, and he did let me know about that in advance. So speaking of, of qualified women who were able to, to do the work in the city, uh, the next person to sign up to speak is Ms. Brittany Ward, uh, who I know as a, <laughs> yeah, she de definitely deserves a hand clap for what she does with the youth in the community. So Ms. Ward, if you'd give us your name and your address for the record, and a little bit about your organization, please. My name is Brittany Ward. I live at 3931 Harwood Street in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Zip code is 27105. Uh, I represent an organization called Hoops for Life. We were established in 2014. And a little bit about Hoops for Life is that we provide mentoring, tutoring, and skill-based basketball training to uh, at-risk youth and young adults. Um, the service that we provide, uh, the ages that we provide services for, usually uh, stem from a, um, two years old and to 24, actually. So um, I felt that it was important to um, get the family involved. Hoops for Life is actually an acronym. My life is spelled L-Y-F-E. It's an acronym for helping low-income youth and families everywhere. It's impossible to change the mindset of a child if you don't reach back for the parents. So it's, uh, it's actually a big uh, program where we do, um, we service a lot of programs to uh, help the, the kids and the family, the parents as well. So um, with that being said, uh, we are just finishing up with our uh, summer program. It's 10 weeks, consists of 10 weeks, where we um, have the um, kids come in and they do, the first part is academic based. Um, second part, we do some kind of sports, um, basketball. Um, we uh, I, uh, measure their um, growth based on uh, their first report card going back into the school year. So last summer, I had 25 kids, uh, getting their first report card going back into the school year, all of the kids made honor roll. So that was, definitely, that was definitely a success rate in itself. And I'm excited to see what the, um, this year, this, uh, the up and coming school year, um, what the kids are gonna um, show me, bring back their report cards. Um, that's about it. Thank you, Ms. Thank Ward. You. Next, next on the list is certainly no stranger to the city of Winston-Salem with the work that he does with Southside Rides. Mr. Dave Moore, if you'll come give us your name and address for the record, please. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Dave Moore. My address is 5385 Springhouse Farm Road. It's on the borderline of Davidson County, but it's the South County address. But uh, yeah, I'm the founder of Southside Rides Foundation and been working hard after my incarceration. I started in 2004. Since then, about 33 guys that opened up their own shop in the auto body. Uh, about 200 of them have gotten jobs at Flo, Modern, Chevrolet, Dodge. Dodge has been a big supporter. Uh, Ford, you know what I'm saying? Because a lot of people don't know auto body technicians is a shortage of them. Even with me uh, working with, I work with Davidson Community College also doing this program in Lexington. And I, uh, got the first class done through the Goodwill and Dodge, I took the guys on a field trip to Dodge and they hired one of the guys, he's doing excellent now. And uh, they contacted me, wanted to get with Davidson Community College to see if they could help train guys or support the training so they get more technicians for the Dodge company. So I'm excited about that. Uh, even with further their education, about 150 guys have furthered their education by going to Forsyth Tech and 
getting an associate's degree or attempting to get an associate's degree in auto body. So I think I'm doing a great job in the city. Also, uh, here recently, the last couple of months, I've been hired at, uh, in Charlotte for Jail North and Jail Central, doing the same, same program in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. So we are trying to make a difference. And it's a mentoring program. And we, we, we got class in the prison here in Winston. Uh, we, we, they hired me to do classes in Lexington, but Lexington don't have room yet, so we're doing it at a goodwill, but we're still getting good outcomes about guys getting jobs and, you know what I'm saying, slowing down on the recidivism. So that's what we're doing in the city. Appreciate your service, Mr. Moore. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Next up on the agenda is with our, my brother, Second Chance, uh, Mr. Antonio Stevenson. I won't mention his, his nickname. He's done a, a lot of good work mentoring students in, in the city of Winston-Salem, even back when I was in high school, Mr. Stevenson. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Mr. Stevenson. Uh, Antonio Stevenson, uh, my brother, Second Chance, uh, was founded about seven years ago. Because of funding, we had to shut down, and we just got reestablished three years ago. We started out with a $3,000 grant from Chris Paul. And since then, I've been funding the program myself. I wrote a book because of all the mentoring I received when I was one of these young brothers that I'm dealing with now. All of our kids aren't in gangs, but they still need some mentoring. And there are initiatives for gang-involved kids, but the kids that are just pillaging the community and need some mentoring. Myself and my board members, uh, Kenny Jordan, Danny Piggott, uh, certain help from uh, members of Omega South Five Return Incorporated have, have stopped, helped me out, and have applied just major aggression when it comes to these kids who are exhibiting aggression. We're trying to keep them out of trouble. Um, in the last three years, we've had three graduates from Forsyth County Schools. Um, we started out with ages 10 to 16, but we saw we needed to follow some of these kids because as soon as we stopped mentoring them, they give in to the streets and they want to hustle. So we, we provided stipends for our youth who work and pick up trash on the weekends and watch cars. So when, when they see that we care, they start caring even more. And I'd like to say thank you all for the opportunity. And I won't stop whether, you know I'm saying, no matter what, because I know these kids are, are in huge need of a look over the shoulder and a push in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. <laughs> Next up on the list, uh, he, he just stood up, so we'll, we'll bring him on to the front. Uh, I, I know him, I think he's with How Is Your Heart Project, but I know him with Beating Up Bad Habits, uh, Mr. David Villada. Yes, I am with Beating Up Bad Habits and at the same time, Get to Know Your Heart. Um, Mr. Alvin Borders is my director and at this time, we've been applying through his 501c3 for our funding. Um, the city did fund us two years ago, $10,000, and I say thank you again for those $10,000. They did great things for our program all year long, the building and everything. I'll tell you a little bit more about me. Um, my program is on Southside. Old Lexington Road, 2500 Old Lexington Road, and it consists of a boxing program. We take kids with at-risk issues and stuff like that off the streets. We mentor kids at the age of 8 to 20, 25. Um, it's hard for me to let them go, you know. Um, we constantly got to keep track of them, what they're doing, what's going on with them. But our main goal is to take them off the streets, put them in a safe location, teach them the art of boxing how to redirect their anger, their aggression. Um, some of these kids don't have nobody to talk to. You know, they don't have somebody that can really understand their issues. Uh, we go more than just training them how to box. We give them conditioning. Um, one day they can become a fireman, um, military, police officer with great conditioning that can lead on great places. Um, we also encourage that if those youth have issues with behavior, with substance abuse, with gang prevention, we refer them to um, professional agencies. At this point, we're working with top priority. Um, I have all kind of kids that, you know, come through our program, excel. We put them and push them to become members of the um, USA Boxing League, which is an amateur league. Um, a lot of those kids that have been picked to that league are at, in Brazil right now. 
um, the Olympics. Um, we had a chance of having one kid looked at two years ago, but because of his age and certain things, he was a little too novice into the system, but he was just too good. He just didn't meet the criteria to be in the Olympics team. Um, just not to babble on, but I really need your help. These kids, these kids need your help. You know, it's, it's really hard to tell them what to do and how to do it when we really can't just provide them with the source and the means to, you know. Um, this summer program meant a lot to our kids. Um, Jose Mendoza, who passed away last year, I mean last week, due to gang violence, was a member of my program, you know, and he's just one of the many that I can say that I've worked with closely, that I've dealt with, and that wanted to succeed, wanted out of life, but for whatever reasons, he just couldn't. Um, we have kids that we push to graduate from high school. Um, we sponsor them all the way through their prom, through suits, through, you know, just helping them get jobs, different things so that they can leave that life alone. Instead of being in the streets selling drugs or doing things, we find them a trade, cutting grass, um, wash my car, you know, walk my dog, feed my dog, I'll pay you, I'll give you a couple of dollars, anything, you know, just to keep these kids off the streets doing what they do. You know, and um, I've worked with Mr. Stevens, I've worked with David, I've worked with Ms. Brittany. We do a lot of different things for these kids, you know, and if nobody tells you, we really need you, okay? And I understand that you guys are doing a lot for us, but we need a lot more funding, a lot more overseas, a lot more facilities for these kids, you know? I appreciate everything you guys do for us. Thank you for your service, Mr. Blotter. And if you notice, none of their names are written down anywhere. We've taken such care and responsibility to handpick those who make a difference. We've got them all memorized. Uh, last on the list, uh, certainly no stranger to the city of Winston-Salem uh, for the works that he's done. He won't be here today, but he has a representative, Mr. Uh, Josh Howard. You know, he's recently got a coaching job at a college, but his foundation does really, really great work. Uh, here representing the Josh Howard Foundation is Mr. Monte Edwards. Good evening. Good evening, City Council members, Mr. Mayor. On behalf of the Josh Howard Foundation, I uh, would like to thank you all for all the hard work that you all do in Winston-Salem, as well as supporting the programs that we apply to you all with for funding to, to be able to help our youth in the community. And uh, you all sponsored us about two years ago for the after-school program that we started over at Sprague Street Recreation Center in the Southside Ward. And since then, we've had about 10 kids, 10 to 12 kids sign up and over the past two years, we've, they've excelled to about eight of them are now on the honor roll list and they're continuing to thrive and, and excel in the classroom. So we're looking to actually add more kids to that program as well as uh, expanding the uh, community progressive development program in the community as well. Um, that way it's helping with job advocacy uh, for those that are uh, needing rehabilitation coming out of the uh, system. Uh, you know, teaching them job etiquette, job interviews, how to go on job interviews, uh, how to dress well, how to, you know, uh, basically social skills, uh, developing, you know, s skills that they would need to function into society to become more productive citizens in our area instead of becoming, you know, going back to the statistics, you know. So we just look forward to making a difference in here, here in our community, not just on the south side, but it's in the city of Winston-Salem itself and hoping that we could, you know, add that trickle-down effect to like-minded people as well as, you know, those that are out there that just need some type of support as well as, uh, you know, some e encouragement. So what we're here to do is offer hope and opportunity to people here in the Winston-Salem community. And I, we, we appreciate your help. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. Thank you. Members of the committee, uh, we will entertain any comments that you may have at this time, but this is an action item. Uh, that does require action. If there are no comments, I'd entertain a motion. And I second with the comments. It's been motioned and properly second. Councilman Rubrick, you have the four for comments. I, I did enjoy all of the presentations and the lady who came up and spoke about starting also with the parents as well as the children. Uh, someone asked me, what are we going to do to get our children and a lot of the minority children educated so that they can become productive and gainfully employed. I say that is a challenge until you start working with the parents and change their minds about what's going on. 
these businesses that are asking through tomorrow's uh, chairman's uh, committee about supporting them just to support them, and they're putting money in a business, in, into this uh, new plan with Winston Forsyth County School Education. Uh, the, and I'm going to say this, and I'm going to be through. The Winston Salem Forsyth County school system segregated education. Somebody allowed this, having people on a school board, to look at the school plan. School assignment meant we're going to send our children where we want them to go, which means when you look at the school system today, when you look at a school where a superintendent would say she had no idea that L.A. Cook was in the predicament it was in, uh, when you put all people alike, there's no challenge. But when you put people who can challenge each other, then we'll have a better educational system. Until someone is able to stand up and say to a school board, shame on you for what you allowed to happen to the winston Southern Forsyth County school system. And I say all that to say the lady who talked about parents and any of you who work with the youth, please bring the parents into it because the parents are so young, some of them, that they too have to be taught. If a mother, a great-grandmother is 45, the next one is 30, the next one is 15, and there's a child that the 15-year-old is raising, and they did not learn how. And until we say to a school board, shame, shame on you, that our school system is in the predicament it is in. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Burt. Item G4, please. Oh, motioned and properly seconded. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. McIntosh. All in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposes likewise. That is unanimous. Thank you. Now, item G4. Item G4, Winston Salem Police Department's report on 21st century policing. Thank you. There, there has been much national discussion about the relationship between the community and the police department all across America. I always say in this city, we're not Baltimore, we're not Ferguson. Uh, however, we must continue to be vigilant to make sure we aren't those cities. The, the president had a task force on 21st century policing and kind of showing us how we measure up against that report is going to be our chief of police, Roundtree, who will give us a presentation. Chief Roundtree, you have the floor. Good evening, Mayor, Good evening. Mayor Pro Tem Burke and Chairman Taylor and other members of the city council. I was tasked with providing a report to the uh, Public Safety Committee on the, re on the recommendations of the President's 21st Century uh, Policing Task Force. And also, uh, many of you received a document from some community leaders titled The 15 Things Your, Your City Can Do to End Police Brutality. So I really wrapped those two documents into one report that I will briefly go over today. You were provided a summary of the President's Task Force on 21st Century uh, Policing in your committee book, as well as there was a link to the entire report. That report is about 90 pages, so we didn't print the entire report for your, uh, for, your, for your book. Also, for the sake of time, I will be briefly just highlighting the areas that, uh, the areas of my review and how WSPD is in compliance with many of the recommendations from the President's uh, Task Force. And just by way of an overview, President Barack Obama, he did sign an executive order on 21st century policing on December the 8th, uh, 2014. This task force was created to strengthen police and community relationships. And as you are aware, this was uh, directly a result of some of the recent events that had occurred around the country at that time. If you do recall, the incident involving Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri occurred August the 9th of 2014, and the President commissioned this uh, task force on December the 14th, uh, de December the 9th, 2014. Task force members uh, were various. It included members of the academic community, uh, law enforcement professionals. Also, it included leaders from the faith base and other professional organizations. The task force recommendations are centered around six main topic areas. Uh, this is the task force that was commissioned, but the task force is considered around uh, six topic areas or pillars. 
uh, building trust and legit legitimacy. Pillar two is policy and oversight. Three is technology and social media. Pillar four is community policing and crime reduction. Uh, five is training and education. And six is officer safety uh, and wellness. And what I did, I broke it down. And you do have a full report that you can read at a later time. But again, I will just hit some of the highlights and how we stack up against the recommendations of the President's task force. Of course, we do have our regular trust talk sessions that have been in existence for a while now. Uh, we've established the Western Salem Police Foundation that's heavily involved in community activities to provide resources, uh, to provide programming, and to provide uh, fund funding not only to police but also to our citizens that we serve. Of course, we're heavily involved in uh, community activities. Of course, we are uh, attend regular meetings with our uh, Hispanic Coalition, the Minister's Conference. We participate in forums and town hall meetings to be inclusive in the community. We have our uh, community priority patrol to uh, work with the community. We have a police explorers program. That's a pro program where we uh, work with youth in our community to educate them on the uh, on the uh, uh, police profession where we take them on camping trips and we do uh, other events with them. We have a dedicated uh, community relations specialist, as you know, to help deal with issues that may arise in the community. And that way we can uh, settle things without involving a sworn police officer that's also helpful many times. And of course, we're heavily, heavily involved in community outreach events, whether it's working with the food bank or providing different types of uh, projects. But those are some of the things that we do to build trust and legitimacy in, in our community. Also, we have police officers that do mentoring, not only in the schools, but they do it in various communities where they work with young people. Some of the, initiative, some of the other initiatives that we do to work with the community to build trust are some of our events, such as uh, stuffing the uh, patrol car initiative, shopping with the cops during the holiday season. Of course, many of you attended the national night events uh, last week. Uh, on Wednesday, we have a uh, back to school uh, book bag and school supply giveaway. And also we do lunch and learn sessions with uh, not only the youth, but also with our elderly in our community to build trust. And of course, on the other side, instead of reading all of them, you can see some of the other events that we are involved in to build trust <coughs> in the community, such as the Special Olympics, uh, going all the way down to we teach driver safety courses in the high schools as well. Also, part of that pillar one, this is the largest uh, pillar when you get a chance to go back and read the entire report. Part of it is creating a diverse uh, workforce. Of course, uh, as a law enforcement agency, you should want your department to reflect the community that you serve. Of course, we've uh, strived to, uh, to reach that goal. We haven't reached it yet, but we're still in the process of, of reaching it. Just some of the things that we have done and we are still doing uh, to have a diverse workforce. Of course, we have this, the college scholarship, the Bond, Rep, the Bond Red Surratt Davis Scholarship. Of course, that was founded and that was implemented uh, uh, at Winston-Salem State University. That's where it started, and it was to, uh, to increase our diversity in, the, in our police department. Of course, that has since moved to other universities in the state now to also help with our recruiting. Also, we have a recruiting and uh, sports sponsorship with uh, Winston-Salem State University. Uh, being the HBCU in the city, we feel that that's important for us to continue that relationship uh, to help diversify our police department. Of course, we, we target heavily at the, at the uh, historical black colleges and universities. We started a partnership with the uh, Winston-Salem Ministers Conference uh, a lot of times we hear different things about, well, you need to diversify the department. So I went to them and asked them to uh, you know, help us recruit so we can help diversify our department. And of course, we attend national, state, and local job fairs. And we do target recruiting of minorities uh, that we work with, with marketing and communication on social media. So those are just the things on the pillar one that we do.
Pillar two Chief. is involving. Chief Roundtree, I'm going to interrupt you for a moment. Please forgive me. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Adams, I think, had a question about yeah. pillar one before we move forward. Thank you. Um, the one thing that I have discussed with one or two council members, one really, is uh, what, do, what can we do? Have we looked at our hiring practices, uh, Mr. Garrity, HR slash chief and others, as to how we hire police? Uh, I know this weekend, again, at the NCB Mill, Mayor Pro Tem was there, Mayor <coughs> Council Member uh, Montgomery was there. And we know this is a trend all over the, the country, but it won't change if we don't look at the policies and the procedures as to how we can get more creative, as to how we get uh, a more diverse force in the communities that are asking for it. When we were doing National Night Out last week, the communities I visited, I told them, if you want to see more police that look like you, like when I was growing up, then somebody needs to be putting in an application and their requirements and, you know, criteria to that. And some of the people did say, you know, well, maybe we need to look at, and I'd already said that. I'm, and Chief, what, what can you tell us about that? Or Mr. Garrity, I think we need to go and look at our hiring policies because other cities are doing likewise. Well. What I can tell you is that we are looking at um, things that we can control. Now, of course, being a sworn police officer, we do have to follow the state guidelines that say a person can't have X number of offenses or whatever it may be. Because even though a police officer is hired by the city of Winston-Salem, they're actually sworn in through the, through the state of North Carolina. So they have certain guidelines that we have to follow as well. But we had a recent conversation this morning with Assistant Chief uh, Bricker, he's here, and also the staff is, is here where we are looking at uh, is there uh, components of our hiring process that we control that we can look at to see if we can do things a little bit differently. Of course, we have to be careful with that. We don't want to lower the standards where we're bringing in additional issues by, by bringing in someone that may not really need to be a police officer, but we do want to be open and give individuals an opportunity that may have had some glitches in the past, but they still could qualify to be a police officer. And that's basically what I'm talking about because, again, the numbers for public safety are not going to be there like they've been ever because of the world changing as it's, it's doing. And unless we get a little bit more innovative and you know, on, on some of the criteria, and I do know it's, it's federal, state, but then that's where we can also work with our legislative agenda to address that and our representatives because if we don't look at how we can kind of modify the process of who gets in, I'm not talking about serial killers or anything like that. <laughs> I'm talking about it's a good idea not to yeah I'm talking about people <laughs> people who probably even people we may need to go look at applications for the past five years that we probably did you know because we had more people coming to the party that we need to go back and look again and maybe give them a second look like employees do because the market is changing and the customer base now is requiring more uh, I did hear at National Night Out in my communities, again, our folks want to see more of a presence. They see the cars, but they want to see the face. And, and that's something we can work it, at, too, with the building, the trust, and the legitimacy. But again, thank you all for everything that you do. Okay. Appreciate it. And just to add another little piece to the uh, recruiting part, we're, con we're going to continue to push our recruiting as, as heavily as possible. Uh, we're planning on featuring it at our uh, upcoming public safety news conferences for the next several months. Of course, currently we have, we started off with 21, but we have 17 students uh, or recruits currently in class, and it took us about eight months uh, to get those uh, 21. Just to put it in perspective a little bit more, uh, we had our school director attend a uh, state conference about two weeks ago now. Typically, there's about 2,200 to 2,800 uh, people in basic law enforcement training across the state, typically. This year, it's 450 
oh, across the state of North Carolina that's, that's in right. basic law <laughs> enforcement training. Right. That includes all the, the big departments such as uh, Winston, Charlotte, Raleigh, Durham, Greensboro that perform their own basic law enforcement training and all the community colleges across the state. Mm -hmm. and, and we don't want to belabor the hour, and Chief, I think we have one more pillar one question, and we're going to try to move it along. Councilmember, Mayor Pro Tem Burke. Yes, thank you. As uh, the council, wait, Mayor, sit down, please. I want to say something in your presence. <laughs> Who are you mm -hmm. After school. Yes. Uh, as the councilwoman was speaking about, as we look at the police, uh, we need police who look like a diverse in this, whether they're black and Hispanics. When you look at the level of where you are and some more minorities, in that next level, we will have very few at your level. One example will be, look at the fire department. This has nothing to do with the people. This has nothing to do with how we feel. We're talking realistic. Mm -hmm. When I became uh, an elected official, our top was mixed better with the fire department. And I had a conversation with the city manager. I said, now look at the top. This is not against you, Mayor or Chief, because you do a good job but you inherited some things when you came here. And to get that fire department look like it should look with a diverse city that we live in, we will have to change. Now the mayor can tell you how it, lo it looked strange when I got elected. And he was assigned to work with me as I was the chairman of the Public Safety Committee. And when uh, Mr. Bill Stewart hired Lucius Powell. Mm -hmm. Lucius Powell knew the challenge. And I said, if you know the challenge, you're going to have to change. And that's when we start getting more of a diverse at the top. Mayor Corpenin said, uh, this can't be like this. And so he said, I'm going to appoint a Blue Ribbon Committee of business people. Because when people come into your city, they want to see diversity. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have little boys and girls of color seeing people of color, a diverse, then it's not going to work. So we need to go back and find when, because you took all the minutes, mm. of when we first looked at how we would make a change. Do you think he would have been a chief of police if we had not made a change? Mm -hmm. Do you think Linda Davis mm -hmm. would have been a chief of police if we had not made a change? Do you think that Pat Norris would have been a chief of police and then these who are falling in as your uh, Assistant Chief, do you think would have happened? What the councilwoman said, you, we have to make change. You talk about the federal guidelines and what we have been an example as far as programs. We, don't, we know that we are good with programs. We know we put the dollars up to have good programs so our city can be a safe city, a good city for all people. But business people like to see diversity too. When they bring people into their company and people want to live in neighborhoods, you're going to have to change. And I'll say again, uh, Mayor, we need to go back, sit with the chairman, the city manager, and look at what we did in order to make change like, because it's going right back. Councilwoman, put it, hit it right on the head on it. The, what's they say, the nail on the head? The head on the nail one? <laughs> nail on the head. <laughs> the yeah. You did it. OK, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, All right. The mayor said he needed to leave, so we, we excuse him. Uh, Chief, pillar okay. two. Okay, pillar two is involving uh, police policy and oversight. It's heavily focused on uh, issues like working with the community, collaboration, also policy uh, dealing with uh, use of force, de-escalation, uh, those type of things that are coming up now. Of course, WSPD has uh, oversight daily through the city manager's office and also through uh, this body here that I'm speaking with. Also, we have the Police Citizen Review Board. Of course, that was uh, implemented in uh, 1993. A lot of cities don't have that uh, uh, a citizen police review board, so those are things that we already have in place. And of course, we have our internal oversight with our professional standards division. That, that is oversight in our policy and oversight on the activities. 
Uh, we regularly uh, uh, provide information uh, as requested on our demograph uh, demographics. Also, we have a use of force committee and a vehicle pursuit committee that provides additional oversight on our policy and also for different things that, uh, that we may choose to make different recommendations on. And we're also required to submit information through the state of North Carolina on our traffic stop data. A lot of things that you hear about traffic stops and racial profiling, that is a mandate by the state that, that we participate in. Uh, pillar three is involving technology, the use of technology and social media. Chief, we've got a question about pillar two. Okay. Councilmember Bessie. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chief, I'm sorry. Um, uh, the, the last four items um, under oversight, under pillar two, the third one, um, references changes in procedure in over 15 years ago to eliminate presenter bias and influence but it doesn't specify uh, out of context i'm not sure what you're talking about there. uh a lot of that is information that's uh, being taught in our blat uh, we do have community members that come in to speak with our uh, rookies also they do teach some of the uh, classes and curriculum to our in-service training so the officers will have a perspective from others. I, I'm sorry, presenter bias and influence in what context, please? I mean, the thing I immediately thought about was the reforms that we, uh, we put in place not quite that long ago with regard to um, uh, suspect interviews, but I don't think that's what you're talking about, so I, I'm not sure what context you're referring to. No, that was not the particular item that I was speaking about. I think that's the item that was provided by Assistant Chief Weaver. I'll let him explain that one. Assistant Chief Weaver. Good evening, Good evening. Chairman of the Public Safety Committee, Mayor Pro Tempore Burke and other members of the uh, City Council. I believe that aspect may be, would you repeat it again so I'm sure that I'm... It's uh, WSPD implemented procedures over 15 years ago to eliminate presenter bias slash influence in accordance with the recommendations from NC Courts and NC Attorney General's office. The one with the, uh, that's the one with the uh, when we show a photographic lineup where the there's a blind showing so if I'm presenting the photographic lineup I don't really I don't know who the person is that way I can't influence the person that's reviewing the lineup okay so that's that's when you're interviewing potential witnesses that that I am familiar with with those reforms mm -hmm. I just yes wasn't mm -hmm. sure that's what you're talking about yes that's what that is thank you very much okay were there any other questions on pillow two? Pillow three, please, Chief. Okay. Pillow three was the use of uh, technology and social media to uh, work better with the community and also build trust. Of course, the Winston Salem Police Department is a leader in uh, technology advances, and I can say that from uh, reviewing other police departments in my role as a commissioner with uh, Kalia. I do have the opportunity to review other police departments across the country, what they're doing, their programs, and the use of technology. Also, the Winston-Salem is one of the few agencies that have full deployment of uh, police body cameras. You know, you have a few in the state that have, that have a few here and a few there, but Winston-Salem, Greensboro, and Charlotte, we are the leaders uh, as far as full deployment. And Winston-Salem was the first agency that had full deployment in our patrol division and some of the other areas in, uh, in body-worn cameras. Also, the use of our uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, our newsletter, and our uh, targeted digital recruiting are also ways that we try to uh, work well with the community. We provide information through crimemapping.com and our police to cons police to citizen information portal. That way we are more transparent. We're not hiding inf any information. The information is out there and it's available to individuals uh, that choose to look at it. Any questions on pillow three? Councilmember Bessie. Yeah, <clears throat> this may be a question for a later point, but I'm, I'm really concerned, I know a number of other folks are as well, that the legislation the General Assembly passed this year uh, reducing transparency of body camera footage uh, is going to make it more difficult to uh, to keep the public shown that our officers are doing things right. Um, and uh, if you have prepared uh, procedures for how we can um, go about inappropriate uh, situations 
petitioning the court for you know permission to release footage um, I'd like to see that and if we don't have that yet I'd, I'd, I'd like to suggest that we work on that the, the legislators have made your job tougher by tying your hands in releasing uh, footage appropriately to the community um, they have left that one avenue we've got to get the court to say we can do it and we have to be ready to use that when when we need to show the the community that the officers have done it right so um I, yes sir i'll look for feedback on that please yes and, and i'll just start left and work my way right so i'm looking at the city attorney uh, the chief uh, mr city manager if we can just kind of maybe compile some information and present it at the next public safety committee meeting chief roundtree okay pillar four is mainly centered around and it focuses on uh community policing and crime reduction and how agencies should work together uh, <coughs> as a community policing agent and work with the community to reduce crime. And again, these are just some of the highlights. You have more detailed information in the, uh, in the information that was provided. Of course, Winston-Salem is a community policing uh, oriented agency where we emphasize meeting and listening and interacting with our citizens. Of course, we partner with other community agencies such as uh, uh, Winston, -Salem's, uh, Winston Salem State Center for Community Safety to reduce crime and work on different strategies. We receive, <coughs> we re we've applied for and received federal grants where we, uh, where we aim to reduce uh, crime and disorder in our community. Of course, we have our dedicated crime analysis unit uh, where we uh, put resources together to provide information to our commanders and our police officers to help reduce crime. Of course, we attend neighborhood watch meetings. We work with different community groups and listen to them to also uh, work together to reduce crime. And we have a criminal intelligence and investigative units that are able to enhance our operations and work on uh, special issues that may come up in our community to help fight crime. Any questions for Pillar 4? Any Pillar 4 questions? Please proceed, Chief. Pillar 5 was mainly uh, centered around the education and training of police officers uh, so they can work together well with the community and join the community to reduce crime. Of course, in our basic law enforcement training, we exceed <clears throat> the state hours for uh, basic law enforcement training. We do provide our officers with crisis intervention training. That's, that's one of the things that, are, that is highlighted in this report. Uh, De-escalation, crisis intervention training, procedural justice, those kind of things are, are, are programs that we're already doing. We are in the contract phase with, uh, to bring in a procedural justice uh, training here for our police officers. We have uh, <coughs> implicit bias and bias-free policing. We also have uh, policies that govern that. Of course, the city of Winston-Salem has the education incentive to uh, help better educate our police officers. And we start our leadership training and basic law enforcement training. And we <clears throat> send all our commanders to some type of uh, uh, long leadership training program, which, which could include the FBI National Academy administrative officers management program through North Carolina State University and also we send our commanders as we have slots to leadership Winston-Salem. We've also uh, implemented an internal leadership training program that is provided to lieutenants and above to provide additional leadership. And of course to the citizens we do have our youth and uh, citizen police academy to also educate our community on police operations and, and <laughs> procedures. Any questions on five? Pillar five questions. Chief Roundtree. And pillar six was centered around uh, cities and agencies providing officer wellness and safety for police officers. Of course, with some of the ambushes and violence that's uh, going on across the country, uh, the task force also looked at that, what's needed to keep officers safe. Of course, our personnel are provided uh, anti-ballistic vests. They are required to wear them while they're out on routine patrol. All personnel are uh, provided a tactical uh, first aid kit. Employee wellness is encouraged through uh, uh, officers are given time to work out on duty. 
Also, WSPD has a, a peer support group where if a, if a police officer feels better with talking to someone in our peer support group than going to a professional counselor, you know, police officers are kind of different sometimes. They may prefer to talk to another police officer instead of going in and talking with a chaplain or some, someone in, uh, at EAP. But of course, those services are provided if, if, if the employee chooses to use those too, the, the employee assistance program. We do have a chaplain's program that the employees can speak with them as well. As well. And then employees are mandatorily referral, re referred to speak with a counselor if they're involved in some type of serious incident, whether it's an uh, officer-involved shooting or if a person uh, <coughs> dies in police custody. Any questions on six? Councilman Bobesi. Yep. Um, I know that we're, we're dealing with the challenge of recruitment right now, and it's a, it's a statewide and a, a, a nationwide uh, challenge. Um, we tried to take some steps recently on, on pay and bonuses. Um, have you no, did you notice any particular point at which there was a, a noticeable dramatic drop off in, uh, in recruit applications that we were getting? Is there, was there any point that you could connect that to in terms of what's been happening publicly? I think it really started with the present class that we have seated now. Mm -hmm. It took us about eight months to hire 21 people. We were actually shooting for 40 in the class that we currently have, and now we were only able to get uh, 21 people to successfully uh, pass the backgrounds and all the other screening. So it probably started, I would say, 10 to 12 months ago. And Councilman Robesi, were you looking for more of a national event that sparked what, consider, what we might consider to be a crisis, or? I, I can go back and look and see what was in the news 10 or 12 months ago, but um, if you had any, anything that you'd project that onto. But I do believe that just some of the, um, the scrutiny, and specifically the last, uh, the ambushes that have occurred with uh, Dallas and some of the other uh, cities, we've noticed that uh, we, we're, we're definitely getting fewer applications. Did it get tougher again uh, after those most yes. recent events? Okay. Yes. But it's not, I mean, clearly the, the, the trend started before then. It was Yes, the trend tougher. started before the, uh, the Dallas incident. Yeah. Thank you. And, and, and just to throw city names, Dallas, Ferguson, Her. Baltimore, Baton Rouge. and many other yeah. cities, yeah. Baton Rouge, Baton Rouge, St. Paul, Minnesota. Let's but try. Ferguson particularly, Councilman Adams, did you want to weigh in before we move forward? <clears throat> yes, and one of the things I guess, Chief, I'll be looking for you and your peers to, to figure out again. Okay, so suppose nobody applies, then what? So in business, somebody's got to be looking down the road at the corrective and preventive action. What's going to be, what are we going to do? Besides everybody just go, well, we're going to arm up, stay at home, and everybody you on your own because... There no, there's no one applying for public safety. I'm looking to you and yours, and, and Chief Mayo, you too. I'm looking. His applications <laughs> are up. I'm looking. <laughs> but again, there's a difference. And that's not to say that fire personnel can't come under the same umbrella, again, when we are trying to protect police so that police protect fire so they can go fight uh, a situation like we learned at Emmitsburg. I'm looking for you and your team going forward, benchmark, go study, go get with some conferences or something, but you are gonna have to bring us some type of answer to the issue because we don't have it. Now, you know, we got a lot of military people. I know a lot of people don't wanna hear that. They don't wanna think of United States being like the countries that are already uh, have military protecting their citizens. But what happens, real life scenario, give me some scenarios, when the numbers drop to the point and attrition, retirement, and all these other things, people quitting, saying, you know what, I got, I can go do something else. Help us and find some type of solution. And that's exactly what's occurring across the state and across the country. There's a lot of uh, fault being put in it from here, from the uh, North Carolina Chiefs Association, from the International Association of Chiefs of Police, from PERF, the Police Executive Research Forum, where all the law enforcement professionals, we understand where, where you are coming from and, and, 
and we understand as chiefs and police administrators, you have to get people to be willing uh, to do the job and take on all the responsibility and the scrutiny and the work that's involved to be a police officer. And what we're seeing with a lot of the millennials, the young people, they're not willing to do that based on what they're going to be tasked to do mm -hmm. and for what they're being paid to do it and face all the viral videos and the public scrutiny. I don't know standing here tonight if there is an answer, but we're doing everything that we can do to get people in the door, to get people interested in, in serving as a, as a police officer. But again, Chairman Taylor, I want you to think outside the box. Take us to one or two, three worst case. Give me the best, better, good, bad, the good, bad, the ugly. Because we need to see that now in our faces, and you and I have talked about this. We need to see it now because right now we're looking at 17 individuals, right? That's correct. Next class might have five. Then what do you do? I'm saying what is the, bring us some scenarios because if this is going to become a, a nationwide, which is just become, going to get the epidemic, it is already. We now need to, just like we were proactive with body cams, you know, this is where people like me said, okay, if I'm going to be a public servant slash public safety, I need to pay these people more money to go do this very encompassing, dangerous job now. Instead of paying 30, 40,000, I may have to go to 70, 80,000 to get the best of the best. And that is a scenario we need to look at. Councilmember Adams, I agree that we need to look at pay, and the, I agree that there are things that the police officers need to do, but as government officials, there are things that we also need to be doing. I think, number one, we have to have the courage to tell the bad stories. We have to have the fortitude and the willingness to tell the good stories. There are bad officers in this country, but there are some really, 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 really great officers. And I always say we have the best police and fire department in, in the country. So when people are doing the right thing, we need to bring them to this committee. We need to bring them before the council. We need to tell their stories. Absolutely. There are some officers who saved lives, and we started to do that as of late. We need to work with you know, the, the media to make sure, even if they don't cover it, fine. But we need to promote stories about officers going out and doing good things. And I'm going to finalize by saying this. I have a wife, and I have three children. Say what you want to about the police, but I'd like to know when I pick up the phone and I've got a problem in my neighborhood, if there's a problem around my house, that a police officer will come and help to protect that's my family. Right. That's right. Now, I do, I have taken measures, as you all know, if you read the paper, to protect my family. <laughs> but I like, <laughs> don't laugh at me, Chief, <laughs> but, I, but I like the fact that we have officers who we can call who will protect our families and our children and our friends' friends and so on and so forth. So you don't have any problems out of me. We just need to learn how to weed out the bad ones and promote the good ones. That's what we can do as a, as, as a council and government officials. Chief, I think we've had six pillars. I don't know if we have any more, but you've got the floor. Okay. And the other issue that was addressed in the information that was provided to the mayor and some of you from a local individual is it spoke heavily on the, the, the militarization of the police. Of course, there's a national narrative being discussed about the police are too heavily armed. We have too much uh, uh, military type uh, equipment. You know, even though many of those people are talking about information that they're really not familiar with and don't understand the reason why their equipment it may not be necessary today, That's but right. when you need that equipment, you need it. That's right. Uh, so I just want to briefly just explain uh, that to you. I think most of you understand, but since I was asked to look at it, I will briefly go through that as well. Of course, this is not your law enforcement in 2016. We are dealing with uh, uh, various uh, issues. Of course, uh, police departments are your uh, main force when it comes to dealing with terrorist attacks. Now, do we need an Apache helicopter that shoots uh, <laughs> missiles? No. no, we don't need that. But is there a need for a uh, police helicopter at times? Yes. Is there a need for a shoulder fire missile from the police department? No, it's not. And we don't have any. But are they out on the streets? Of yeah. course, yes. You see, uh, that's a uh, police officer from Los Angeles that uh, where they recovered a, a shoulder fire missile. Am I too uh, naive to say that uh, it's not a possibility that one of those may be here in Winston-Salem? It could be. But I'm not saying that we need a shoulder-fired missile. Uh, 
of course, with the weaponry, uh, the uh, rifle on the right is a M16, M16 military weapon. Of course, the one on the right is a AR-15. It's really the same uh, weapon. It's one that anybody can go to Gander Mountain, uh, uh, Walmart, and purchase. So if an uh, average citizen can have that type weapon, uh, some of the uh, rhetoric is that the police department shouldn't, but the average citizen should. But it's pretty much the same weapon. It, it, it's just a, uh, a citizen grade of an M16. Also, just to refresh your memory, in San Bernardino, of course, who was the first people to, to assist in that situation? Who else are you going to call? The military is not going to come. No. no. Policing or Ghostbusters. So the That's police right. has to be uh, prepared to respond to any type of event like this. 14 people were killed, 22 were seriously injured at a county facility during a Christmas party. Of course, these were some of the weapons that, of course, they, they could purchase again, mm -hmm. like I said, at a Gander Mountain, any place that sells uh, firearms, they could purchase these weapons. What did the law enforcement have to use to get to them to safely transport uh, police officers and uh, safely get to them? They had to use their uh, tactical uh, personnel carriers. These are ballistic type vehicles. You can't pull up in a patrol car and That's think right. that a uh, bullet's not going to go through that patrol car. That's why you do need these uh, vehicles when you need them. Of course, this is just some of the photographs that show how the police officer could be moved from place to place and how the vehicle was surrounded. Uh, the Purse Nightclub uh, in Orlando. Of course, this was one of the worst uh, mass shootings in U.S. history. It was a terrorist attack. 49 people were killed, 53 were injured. These weapons were bought by the suspect same AR-15 and a handgun at a local gun shop. So the, the, uh, the talk that the police shouldn't be armed with some of these uh, type weapons, I don't really understand that, because who else is going to go in a nightclub to, to, to get that person out? Also, the uh, police in Orlando, they had to breach the building from the outside, again, using a, um, a tactical vehicle that's capable of uh, punching a hole in the vehicle so the police officers could get inside and also uh, rescue individuals that were trapped inside. Again, this is a similar type vehicle that was used. Uh, this is a Bearcat uh, vehicle used to transport personnel, also used to rescue personnel, and it was used to, uh, to rupture the side of the building again. You know, there may have been some people in the club the night before this event, they probably said, why did the police need uh, those tactical vehicles? But on the night that it was needed, I'm sure they didn't ask those questions. And I also asked, uh, why did the police need those uh, uh, military-style weapons? And again, there's always questions about the equipment. This is a ballistic helmet that was actually shot into uh, during the uh, during the exchange of gunfire in Orlando. And the sheriff deputy, even though he's heavily armed and he's also equipped with protective equipment, that equipment is needed when you're going into a situation where a person, I mean, he's not shooting a slingshot, he's shooting a, a, a 223 uh, round weapon at them. So of course, if a police officer is going in dressed the way I'm dressed with only a sidearm, you can understand what the outcome is gonna be. So that's why the need, we do have the need to have these weapons when the situation arises. Uh, some people get concerned about police wearing riot gear. That was in the, the second report. Of course, this is one person that's throwing a rock. Again, if you line the police up on the street with people throwing bottles and rocks, dressed the way I'm dressed without any kind of protection, of course, you can understand what's going to happen, as well as if uh, people are throwing uh, uh, Molotov uh, uh, cocktail incendiary devices as well. Uh, so we do have uh, uh, some of this type of equipment. It's needed in certain situations. We use it only when it's necessary to use it. But again, it is used to protect uh, police officers. It's used to protect citizens uh, so we can end any kind of situation uh, safely. 
And again, uh, we're the only people that you can call. The military is not going to come because this is a, a, a civilian type uh, incident. There is an expectation if, it, if, if an event like this happens in Winston-Salem. I think our citizens would expect us to be able to go in and handle the situation and have the necessary equipment to do it. And again, we can safely move personnel and we can also use it to rescue personnel. Are there any questions for Chief Roundtree at this time? I have one for the city manager. Okay, thank you, Chief. Well, before we, are there any members of the audience who, who have any questions about the report? Councilman Adams. Yes, Mr. Garrity, mm -hmm. again, you know I went to Emmitsburg with some of the people that are here today. Um, I still wonder, when are we going to have a coordinated attack live drill in the city of Winston-Salem before we get to a pulse or any of these other occurrences, officers down, they've been ambushed. I need, you know, the coordinated effort of all of the agencies and other people that went, Forsyth County, I don't know, maybe we've had a little bitty one, but people are also asking people like us that, Okay. Are we really prepared in light of what's going on, going back to showcasing our public safety when they're, they're the best of the best, not waiting on the press, but we do it. We also need to communicate a sense of safety that we're prepared if anything should happen. And, and I, we always ask Mr. Sadler, you know, and I know he brings all of those organizations together as the director of emergency management, are we prepared? And Councilmember Adams, they do that periodically from time to time, and we ask him, the answer is always yes. Um, Mr. Sadler, are we prepared? Yes. <laughs> well, and we'll work with the manager to try to. I was going to say, I, I hear him, but the mm -hmm. city manager knows what I'm looking for. Yes, ma'am. Respectfully, we'll work on trying to, trying to look at that and bring that back, Thank Councilor you. Adams. Chief, if there's nothing further, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely excuse you. So we appreciate the presentation. Uh, there is an item, G5, I don't believe it's time sensitive. Uh, we had. A couple of people come and speak to the city council about the concept of banning wild animals from performing in the circus. They kind of felt like, number one, it was a bad thing to do, and number two, it could be harmful to our citizens who attend the circus. So we investigate public safety from all angles. We'll hold that item in committee and talk about that at our next committee meeting. So uh, members of the council committee, members of the public, uh, Mr. Turner. Mr. Chairman, I would just uh, request that if any committee members or other members of the council have any questions about the topic, that they get them to me so I can provide that to you in your next committee meeting. Thank you. And, I, and I'll say very briefly, there are three options. We could implement, implement a city ban on all animals in, in circuses uh, from the city. I know there's one other city that's done it. I think it was Asheville. We could implement a ban on just wild animals in circuses. We could adopt some rules for handling the management of animals in circuses while in the city. And then lastly, we could leave in place the existing city ordinance and allow the county animal control and state animal cruelty statutes to address the issue raised. So there are four options. Just kind of marinate on them and mold them over in your mind. If you have any questions, send those to Mr. Turner. Is there anything else for the good of the order? Seeing nothing. Oh, Chief Roundtree. I just wanted to briefly recognize the staff here tonight. Of course, we have Assistant Chief Wilson Weaver. We have Assistant Chief uh, Bricker, Assistant Chief Thompson, and Captain Miles here tonight for the pleading. And while, while we're making announcements, I want to thank the Moors and uh, Mr. Macon, who is one of our new community activists in the city, for coming out and being involved with what we're doing here in the city. Seeing there's nothing further, we consider this meeting to be adjourned. <laughs>